Hey guys, welcome to Invest Soup. Today I want to introduce you to a good friend of mine named Dan Barrero. He is one of my partners on Campfire Real Estate. Check us out every Thursday on Instagram Live uh, on one of our channels. You can always check my channel and uh, you'll be able to find out who's hosting. Uh, and uh, just a really good friend of mine. We've known each other for a few years. We were introduced by a friend of ours, Rick Jarman, and we became fast friends. And uh, fast forward four years later, three and a half years later, and uh, Dan is now a guest on my podcast, Invest Soup. So welcome, Dan. Thank you for being here. And today we're going to dig deep. I'm going to make you uncomfortable and you may cry. So be ready, okay? <laughs> All right, guys, so Dan and I have known each other for a while, and uh, I just want to make a general announcement right now. Dan's very excited about it. He's got a new addition to his family. Uh, it's called a truck. We've been bothering Dan about that for a long time now. He drives a van that is held together by love and bailing wire, and, <laughs> and we've been trying to get him to buy a new truck, and he bought one yesterday. He's got 300 miles on it already, and I think he slept in it last night. So uh, congratulations on the new addition to the family, Dan. Uh, I, I got to tell you, I wish I did it sooner. I wish you had to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure your wife does, too. Yeah, um, everybody, everybody was like, it's about time. <laughs> but you know what's funny is, you know, the way you and I – started investing we didn't have any investing experience we didn't have any money and uh both of us you started longer uh longer period back but uh, we both started quite a while ago and it's it's funny those habits that you get to surrounding money and the lack of money when you're coming up it's it's hard to give those up as you get older and, I, and i'm starting to do it now probably in the last 12 to 24 months and I, I know you've done other things but that was the last that, that was the last holdout right the, yeah the, I, I've always had a hard time purchasing any vehicle let alone mm -hmm. you know a truck of this caliber at, the, at that expense because mm -hmm. I didn't need the truck per se it's, it was a want right yeah. but yeah. you know I've done everything to the point where there's no reason why I can't treat myself we got you know, because we've invested in, in, in cash flow, um, we prioritize investing in cash flow to pay for our wants. But still, you kind of feel guilty when you're like splurging that kind of money when you've lived, you know, all this time, always worried about, you know, saving, saving, saving so that you could buy another mm -hmm. cash flow property. Right. Um, yeah. And then as a result of that, then when you do get that cash flow, you're like, wait a minute. I could use this cash flow, go buy another property. So was, my wife was laughing. She was like. You spent two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars on a condo in Florida. You didn't even see it, and you have you could sleep well at night. And you go spend you know seventy, eighty thousand dollars on a truck, and you're nervous. And yeah. Says, well, that makes me money. Trucks go down in value. You know. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. But it brings you happiness, which, and I think that's worth talking about. A lot of people never lose that mindset of frugality. It is hard. Yeah. It is hard to shift yeah. uh, when you've been living like that for so many years. Um, but you know. We've spoken. We we know each other personally. You know, I have four kids. My youngest just graduated from Northeastern. I'm done. Yeah. You know, so you know, it's like when is it time for for me and my wife, right? So to yesterday, you know, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we've we've been taking some really expensive uh, trips to Europe and things like that, treating ourselves. Yeah. And that's another thing, right? So I don't mind spending money on on family vacations, and my kids are adults, and Dad will pay for everything. Dad and Mom. But to me, that's like, let, let them enjoy my wealth while we're alive together because uh, memories don't depreciate. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, you said something right there that you and I have talked about before is enjoying our money with our kids before we pass away rather than not being able to see the, the joy on their face and being able to go to Hawaii or Europe or you know, go to the yeah, fish it's, store it's, and, it's, and you do can't, some weird things. Yeah, those are priceless moments, and you know that's yeah. that's something that we have to. I think we should be talking about more when we're doing this publicly. Is you know prioritize what you spend your money on. You know, trucks are great, cars are great, but they eventually break. They eventually depreciate. 
those memories mm-hmm. with you know spending time with, and money with the people that actually matter in your life that doesn't depreciate it doesn't and i know if if you're a young guy or gal out there you're 25 uh, you know how important family is, but you're into more experiences with other people at this point. And, but trust me, it will come back to the family thing eventually, and you will end up spending the majority of your time with your family if you get along with them. Uh, it, it happens to everybody. It really does. Uh, if you don't get along with them, then, you know, it might not. But for the most part, that's where it all ends up. <clears throat> and where Dan and I are right now is, Pretty much that's what we live for is those weekends and, and moments like that with our adult children. So anyway, we sound like a couple of old farts. Let's get I, into I, I just want to say something else. That has a you know, that to me doesn't matter. I, I know a lot, a lot of wealthy people. Mm-hmm. I have no relationship with their with their with their either significant others, their siblings, their parents, mm-hmm. their kids. Mm-hmm. What the hell is all this for, right? I mean, but do you think do you think that's due to the fact that they're so busy chasing dollars that they don't have time for them? Well, that's a good point, Mark. Yeah, and and I think I think that's something that's very real, and we got to be careful. You know, you and I have had that discussion. When is enough enough? And we've talked about that on Campfire Real Estate. But you and I have talked about that personally, and and we neither one of us really have a good answer for it. Right. Neither one of us are done where I don't see any time in the future where I'm going to stop doing what I do. But I might not do it. So, yeah, but I might not do it so much and I might not take it as seriously as I have the last, you know, say, 20 years. Right. Um, we're, We're adding. I think you and I are both in the stage where we're adding carefully to our portfolio and uh you know there's there's a lot of folks out there starting right now just like you and I did that can learn a lot from guys that have been through it and and the mistakes that we've made you know I often tell people and you agree with this I know you do that the mistakes that we made make us more valuable than the victories that we've had yeah absolutely I've made more money from the lessons learned from my mistakes and the victories. Yeah. 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 Because every time you can take that, that mistake and turn it around and, and cause if we fix it, if we learn how to fix that mistake, then that means we can go out and use that technique. Again. And, and those, and those are the better entrepreneurs, in my opinion, uh, entrepreneurs, what do we do? We get paid to fix problems. We're resolving right. a problem, right? So there's a housing yeah. crisis right now in the United States. Yeah. And we get paid handsomely to, to resolve that pro- housing problem. To, mm-hmm. to create, you know, a roof, a housing for for other people, right? Um, that's right. But, so, you know, that's what we do best. That's what entrepreneurs mm-hmm. do best. I mean, think about, you know, the person who came out with this with, with the smartphone, right? I mean, mm-hmm. the reality is there was a need for it. Someone came out with this idea. Somebody came out with, 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 with you know, um, resolving the problem. The crazy mm-hmm. part was it resolved problems that people didn't even realize that they had. Yeah, right. so true, so true, so true. And that's that's a true entrepreneur who sees an upcoming issue or sees something that will make someone's life better, and they come up with a product or something that that will do that, and it goes gangbusters like like phones. And, and now there's not everybody has this, this, including the kids coming. I see kids coming off the bus with this thing, right? You know, mm-hmm. they're, they're in junior high school and they got a twelve hundred dollar phone. Yeah. I mean, it's insanity right now. I agree. I agree. So getting back to what you said earlier, though, is that, you know, we provide we provide something that everybody needs, which is housing. There's a very big shortage in the United States right now uh, of houses for sale. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that nobody wants to sell anything with their three percent interest rate. It's not only the houses for sale, but it's only also rentals. I mean, this is yeah. in in every major metropolitan area. Any major city of any importance has mm-hmm. a housing shortage for people for rent right now, right? Mm-hmm. Especially affordable mm-hmm. housing, rent you know at affordable rates. So, yeah, and we 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 are we are the saviors. Yeah, I uh, do you agree with the statement? There's plenty of Class A properties out there right now, but we have a big shortage of Class C. A uh, big shortage, Class C. A very big shortage of like Class C plus, B minus, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, totally agree. 
Yeah, so it, I stay away from the eight class properties. Uh, one, the sexiness doesn't, the, 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 it elevates the, the acquisition costs and the mm -hmm. returns aren't as high. Plus, mm -hmm. those people are very needy and I don't have the patience for, for neediness. Um, but, yeah. uh, you know, I like, I like, like the B minus, C plus uh, uh, area because I, I feel like I'm creating value. I'm creating mm -hmm. a, a really a, 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 a clean, safe environment for people to live in. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I'm creating value in the sense that I'm providing a, 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 a product that we have a shortage of in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, you know, class B and C, class B minus C plus, is where A class people go when their job gets downgraded in a recession or when they get laid off. And, you know, I always look at it, it's like a pyramid, right? You know, class A, there's only so many people in the class A sphere, right? But as you go down this triangle or this volcano or a upside down V, what shall we call it? Um, just get more, you get more and more potential customers, more and more potential tenants. So the, the pool of people gets bigger and bigger. So there's more people to absorb that, uh, that inventory. Uh, and it and, creates a lot of competition considering the fact there's a, there's a shortage of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've got uh, no problem filling places right now. It's, it's, oh, it's yeah, easy. It's, it's, I have an empty apartment. I just did a live video on it today. Um, Tenant was there for three years, um, which is not normal for me because most of my tenants in the area are between uh, seven and nine years. Mm -hmm. But she got a job and she just moved to California uh, working for Showtime. But mm -hmm. in, in either event, she left the place so spotless. I only have to put one man in there. He'll have that place done in about two and a half days, three days, painted, awesome. cleaned, everything. Um, so the, the, the point is that uh, so it'll, realtor, it'll get rented out quick, right? Yeah, the realtor's asking me if she could do a a, 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 a showing, or rather, you know, open house on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, you could do that. And I'm like, what's the problem? She says, Danny, she goes, I'll get 30, 40 people there in a two-hour window. Easy for that apartment. You'll have, yeah. you'll, she says, you'll have multiple applications. Um, That's question awesome. question is, are you going to accept them? But you know, yeah, well, kind of we, know how, we know how much of a stickler you are in your applications. So. Yes. <laughs> Dan's, Dan's got a, uh, a, a very uh, strongly written contract. And uh, Dan, you know, when I have landlord questions, and I'm a landlord. I've been a landlord for a long time. But if I have landlord questions, uh, I definitely go to Dan for that. He's pretty well versed, even though he's in you know different state than I am. He's in New York and Florida. And it's, all, it's all the same. It's all the same, no matter what state you're in. It's you know basic common sense stuff. There's nothing in this business that really changes. I mean, there's a book called uh, "The Richest Man in Babylon." Yep, read it a couple times. That book, you know, is literally about a man in Babylon. You know, mm -hmm. two, three hundred years ago, four hundred years ago. Still the same concept, right? Um, yeah. You know, there's really nothing new in this business. It just no. I agree. Course. I agree. I agree. I agree. So and, when and, you st don't go deviate. ahead, sorry. Don't deviate. Yeah, that's the funny thing is if you just stick to this for 10 years, literally, if you stick to it for 10 years, put your time, your effort in, you can be set. Now, it's an addictive game, so you won't be. You'll always strive for more. Uh, but in 10 years, you could be set if you if you work hard. You could be set in five years, but 10 years is more realistic. So if you're yeah, 25 not, now, I tell people this is not a get rich quick business. Um, but you know, any business worth its weight in gold that's going to last forever mm -hmm. is never going to be uh, quick. Um, no, no, I agree. I agree. It's all it's all slow growth. I mean, even two or three years, uh, you can have a, a decent amount of stuff, but it's not going to be cash flowing where you want it to yet. So, but 10 years. And, and, you know, 10 years goes fast. If you're 25 now, if you're 23 now, and you're 33 when you're to the point where you could retire, but you're not going to more than likely, you know, it goes quick. Yeah, time yeah, goes so, so, it's so funny. fast. I think the tank, the, 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 what determines what our thought process is, whether 10 years goes fast or not, is our age, right? Yeah. So if, you tell, if you said to a kid who, you know, is six years old, they got to wait uh 
you know, a month before they could go see Santa Claus at the mall, they would, you in their minds, it's like waiting a year, right? To yeah. us, it's like, oh my God, it's going to go like, it's, it's going to feel like a week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I totally. think uh, 10 years is, is to uh, you and I, it seems like not a lot of time. You know, when I was 25 years old, someone told me 10 years, I'd be like, oh, damn it, I need to make money before 10 years. But the reality is, um, it, it's not, you know, it, it does go quick and you just have to stay the course. And the funny thing is I, I was doing something on that earlier on procrastination, which I'm, I'm the king of. And, you know, we all do that when we're, when we're, as we get older, you know, I'm going to start investing when I'm 25, you know, I'm 20 years old now. I'm going to start investing when I'm 25. At 25, it's like, well, I want to get a new car instead. At 30, it's like, I want to start taking some nice vacations. I want to reward myself. I'll start investing when I'm 35. You just keep moving it down the road. And then pretty soon, you know, it gets to be a little bit late and you're 55 years old and it's like, all right, I got to get ready to retire. But, you know, you, it's not going to be till you're 65 or 70 that you can actually do it if you wait that long. I mean, what? how long ago did you buy that property in Brooklyn, that one we talk about all the time? 1989, my first Nin property. 1989, you bought it for how much? $72,000. $72,000. And that's worth what now? About seven hundred and fifty grand, which is a massive return, right? Seven hundred and fifty, eight hundred grand right now, right? I just had an offer last year for 2.5. I'm sorry, million? 2.5 million, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, I was joking. I knew how much it was worth. But so you think about that. Just the amount of time. And, and I know a lot of guys that go out and sell their properties when they get older. Yeah, they could keep them, but they sell them and they cash out and they live off the money. Not saying to do that, but Dan has that one property and he could basically, because I know his house is paid for, he could basically sell that house, put that money in index funds, not suggesting he do that. And what's, what's two times eight, 16, yeah, he'd be making about an average of one hundred and sixty to two hundred thousand dollars a year in in returns, and, and with the he, with the CD the CD rates right now because of uh, prime rate going up, I mean I'm seeing CDs at five and a quarter percent one year one year hold. Just like the good old savings accounts when you you and I were younger, right? Uh, yeah, I can't. I I it's been like twenty years since I've seen something like that. Um, yeah. But look, the point is. <sighs> In this business, the real money, like Mark and I already know, let's just make sure the audience understands this, is in the long-term hold, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna, you, you know, but does, do Mark and I, we do a lot of fix and flips? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we wholesale. Uh, Mark does a lot more wholesaling than I ever did. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is that's quick money so that it generates cash for us to go buy long-term hold, which is yeah. gonna then create our cash flow that buys our wants, like our trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's discipline because uh, I see a lot of people get into this business. They make seventy five thousand on their first flip, you know, and I see them driving a brand new Mercedes, and then they and, go and back to an odd money lender, paying twelve percent mm -hmm. instead of having use that seventy five thousand and 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 create their own bank and pay mm -hmm. themselves back another twelve percent and keep more of the profit margins. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it's all about um, discipline. Financial yeah. discipline. Yeah, yeah, it is. And not not many people have it. Not a lot of people have it. But if you can figure it out, you'll become so wealthy in this game. But you know, you have to you have to learn. You have to get that first one. It's funny, I see real estate agents doing the same thing. You know, they get that first big deal, you know, make twenty grand or whatever. And it's it's it opens up their eyes. And if they get that deal too soon, it ruins them. You know, then they're not going to be a real estate agent for very long. If they don't work hard for that first deal, if that first one rolls in and Aunt Sue decides to list their house the day they get their license, they're pretty much sunk in my book. Well, you know, what's funny. The people. I find the best real estate agents that I've worked with are real estate agents that are also investors. Yes. Yeah. Because they have yep. a much better understanding of what you and I need. Mm -hmm. And they have a much better understanding on how to negotiate differently. It's a different mindset. 
than dealing, you know, you and I, I could tell you without a doubt, I don't even have to ask you because you're going to agree with me. When you're dealing with a realtor that specializes with end users, mm -hmm. they don't, they're not usually very successful with people like us. Mm -mm. But if you have a realtor that also owns property or has owned property in the past, they have a much better understanding of where our numbers need to be. And when they go to sell, rather present the offer, they're selling the offer rather than just presenting it. And mm -hmm. given it, it's selling the offer, well, yes. Can you get more from an end user? Yes, you can. Uh, what's the likelihood of you, you know, having to go to two or three end users because of the mortgage keeps falling apart, because the roof is leaking, or there's not enough, the plumbing is, is in dis mm -hmm. disrepair, right? So whereas with, it, with people like us, they're going to sell the offer, whereas, you know, yeah, you're going to, will you get less by selling to Dan Barrero and Mark McMahon? Sure you will. But, but, they're going to say, sorry about that. But they're also That's going to okay. say, but they're taking it as is. You don't even have to clean out your personal stuff if you don't want. And it's right. subject to no mortgage. It's subject to no uh, inspections. You know, this is a definite close. How fast do you want to get out? Do you want to stay here for the next year hoping that you get an end user? Mm -hmm. Right? So they're selling the offer. They're not just presenting the offer. And they're not presenting it fearful that it may be too low. They're, so they're, they're selling the benefits of the offer. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, is real estate agents don't realize how much more money they could make if they could just learn a few skills to work with investors. Because the one thing that, that, that boggles my mind is, you know, real estate agents, and, and I'm not slamming real estate agents. I are one, and Dan was one. And I make money selling houses. I make money buying houses. I make money in a lot of different ways. But agents that don't learn how to work with investors. It just always surprises me. You know, they say, oh, you know, investors are difficult. They never, they never buy anything I bring them. It's, well, number one, you're not bringing them the right properties. You're not vetting them. But investors buy all the time. I, Dan, every time I, every time I talk to you, you've bought a new condo, right? Every single time. So Dan's buying a condo every month, sometimes two, sometimes three. I don't buy that many. My properties out here are too expensive for that. But still, he's got a couple of real estate agents he works with that make a lot of money from him, and they don't have to work that hard to do it. They just bring deals to him that they know he wants, right? Because he's talking hey, I'll exactly give you, I'll give you an example wants. of one I just purchased. Um, okay. This was a realtor. Had, mm -hmm. I bought for her in maybe five months. Because mm -hmm. she only brings me things that fit the parameters, right? They got to yeah. fit inside the box. Yeah. And she calls me up and she says, one of the, you know, you know, realtors have those morning meetings once a week. Uh, mm -hmm. They call morning meetings on Wednesdays. And she says, mm -hmm. uh, just left the morning meeting. Um, one of the realtors in the, in, in, in the meeting presented a condo that they just put, they just uh, listed last night. Uh, they're going to put it on the MLS tonight. But I know it's a community you buy in. I said, sure. Mm -hmm. What's the number? So she says, this is the asking price, but let me send you the pictures. And I, I know those those units like the back of my hand. I must have flipped in that one community at least 200 doors. I currently own about 30 doors in that one community. Um, Crazy. So I, I just looked at the pictures. I said, this is the number. Um, she went and you know presented it to the listing agent. The listing agent knew who I was also and knew, knows that I close on everything that I say yes to. Uh, and I'll close it as soon as title's ready, right? Well, we got that door at about maybe only 30000 below market, but that's mm -hmm. okay um, because literally the market has gone up another 12% in the last three months in that particular area. So I've made my, I, I, I've made my, 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 my cushion on the asset appreciation, and from the point, from the point that I bought it, I, I've increased my, my value, right? So, mm -hmm. But the point is that I would – that I, I would never have had that opportunity if she wasn't at those morning meetings. Like so, mm -hmm. when I had my real estate license, I made it my business to go to all those morning meetings because mm -hmm. I would then pick up those 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 golden nuggets, that, you know, that no one else would see or before it went on the MLS, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other best part of, of of being a realtor in the business is that, you know, I I don't I don't want to go to those continuous ed classes anymore. So my partner, who's my brother, went and got his license, and it's his turn now to do it because I did it for 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but the best part is, and and Mark, I'm sure you're going to agree with me, is those referral fees, right? 
So mm-hmm. when someone buys from me, I get a referral fee from the realtor who lists it. When someone sells for me, I get a referral fee, right? Um, sometimes people call me up. I can't help them, but I have a great agent that can. I'm going to get a referral fee. It adds up. It adds up where it pays for all my vacations for my kids and I and my oh, wife yeah. and I go on vacation, you know, together uh, th- two to three times a year. Yeah, we we are probably, we average about sometimes more, sometimes less, but whether it's savings or commissions or whatever, we get about probably $200,000 a year on top of our rental income, on top of our flip money, on top of our education, on top of all the other businesses that we have, we get an extra $200,000 a year in commissions. When we purchase properties, we help, we represent people. I bring deals to other investors that I don't want to take down or I don't want, I, I can't take down, whatever the case may be. And then I list my own properties when I flip and uh, I save, you know, all that money. You know, I don't have to pay myself a commission. It's it's crazy. It's crazy how much more money you can make. Yeah, and it also, it also put, I find that it also allows us to be in the room with other realtors. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Real, you know there's, there's always a realtor convention somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We and it's, a, it's it's clicky. You know, you've they they don't want to talk to normal people when it comes to business. No, it's you very know, clicky. But I, we couldn't get in there without like so we we have a group through Remax. It's called the Barrero Group. Um, mm-hmm. That's the other thing, Mark. It that it, this was done for for access. So the other real the real reason we also went into it was because I wanted quicker access to, to uh, stuff that came on the MLS, especially when the electronic boxes came out. Remember, you just uh, you had a key fob, um, and you would just go in. It didn't matter if the apartment was empty or the building was empty. You could go in at any time of the day, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I see stuff that, that would hit the market at 10 o'clock at night. If it was local and it was something that I wanted, I'd leave my house, and I was in there at 1045 in the middle of the night with a flashlight, right? Because I had the key fob, and I had my license. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I still I still get phone calls every once in a while because with the you know the new lock boxes, the, the agents informed yes, whenever anybody notified. goes in. And unless if they don't have time constraints on there, which a lot of people don't, uh, I'll, I'll drop by at 11 o'clock at night to go look at a property, and then I'll... I'll get a, a text. What are you an agent? What are you doing there that late? It's like well, exactly. But the point it. is, you know, I've gotten that text. I've gotten that phone call. It says, yeah, I'm the emperor and I'm in the property. And he says, well, what are you doing there that late? I says, well, I came to check. And do you want a contract? I'll send it to you before midnight. Right. Yep. I'll sometimes yep. even offer a masking price because sometimes realtors didn't price it right. Right. Yeah. But and I know it, and I want to get I want to get ahead of the competition. Yep, so, or we'll you know, see that. Having ex- a license creates a lot of different avenues, mm-hmm. uh, but the best part is we didn't we because of our negotiation skills as as investors. The Barrero Group in, in New Jersey through Remax, where I think we were ranked like number ten in the state now, um, wow. primarily because so many people come to us as a result of our reputation as investors, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's grown to to a sixteen member and. And the best part is of the six people that are on the team, four of them are real estate investors. That's that's awesome. What a great niche. And there's not a lot of people doing that. No. You know, it's funny when you get into the investing world, you think everybody's doing it, but it's still a very, very small click. And, uh, you know, especially real estate agents that invest, that's even smaller. So most people that invest aren't agents. They're just not. And most agents don't invest. Right. Crazy. And then the thing is, I hate when I hear an agent t- trying to sell me a property. I'm like, if it's so good, then why don't you go buy it? You know, or, you know there's, there's, uh, there's a couple of groups, uh, agent uh, brokerages out here where they'll, you know, they'll call me up and they say, well, we just got the property across the street from you. We sold the one down the corner for X, Y, Z dollars. And I'm like, why would anyone pay for that? And then they'll tell me, well, I said, well, what's the rent? And they tell me, he says, yeah, okay. I said, but how do you justify that price? Well, once you get rid of the tenants and you renovate, and this is how, this is what the rent, rental income will be, and that's why it's worth it. I said, well, then why don't you get rid of the tenants? Why don't you go renovate and get that that get that get income that you suspect that you could get? And then I'll buy it at that number, you know. Um, but th- the point is, you know, 
having your license does give you a heads a benefit mm -hmm. over, over your competition. Oh yeah, I totally agree. I'll, I'll always have it. I'll always have it. We have a, you know, we have a second home in Hawaii, and and uh, our close friend and neighbor is a, a big real estate agent in the area where our place is, and we send people to her all the time, and we get a twenty five percent referral fee. It's amazing. It's amazing. And it adds up at the end of the year. Oh, God, yeah. Especially when these are three, four million dollar condos. Yeah. yeah. So for us, I mean, my average is probably between 130, 140. Um, and then, of course, I have a partner, so we split that. But to me, that's all found money. Oh, that's. Because my, my numbers aren't as high as yours, right? My my you know, you're you're dealing with California yeah. numbers. I'm dealing primarily with Jersey and, and, and Florida numbers. They're, they're very much lower than your numbers. Yeah, but still, it's like you said, it's found money and, and, and I wouldn't I'll never give it up. Never give it up. No. In fact I'm always thinking of other ways to make more money with my license. So, oh, without a uh, doubt. Yeah. Yeah, there's always I've got a few things cooking. I got a few things cooking. So you bought that first place. Uh, I know you went through a lot of heartache on that particular. Actually, that purchase. one was simple. It was the second property that I bought. I the second through. one. Okay. Okay. T t tell us, give us the 60 second, give us the three minute version of that. Essentially, the first one went so smoothly, even though I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't know what a comp was. I didn't, I negotiated that on a, it was totally on a, on a, that was a rebound. That was, that was just luck. Mm -hmm. Um, it happens. The second one, I just I had just suspected that it would be always that easy, um, and I got robbed. I got robbed. <laughs> I got robbed by my mortgage broker. I got robbed by the contractors. Uh, the tenants schooled the living hell out of me. Um, it was it was a miserable, miserable, miserable five years, five to six years. Yeah, um, did you what what did you financially what kind of shape were you in during that time? When I first got into it I thought I was financially good. Mm -hmm. But it sucked up all my money in me within 12 months I I was I was I was in a very bad position. Um what got me over the hump was that I had a lot of anger in me. Um I was always a a, a fight a fighter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I had to learn how to take my anger and move it from my fist to paper and pen and to my mind, how to use it with words. And but it got me through because, you know, my accountant, my my my, my attorneys, they were like, you know, declare bankruptcy. You don't have to pay anybody. And I just couldn't do it. I just my ego, my pride didn't let me do it. Um, logically is probably would have been logically the best thing to have done uh, economically, probably as well. But um, I ended up selling my wife's car. My car I ended up taking all the money out of my wife's uh, 401, 401k. It was a terrible situation. But, you know, I went through the storm. That building today is my flagship property. It's worth about $6.5 million. And you paid how much for it? Uh, between all the renovations that we've done and we added a third floor to it, uh, at, at those years, at, this is 1990 prices, right? Mm -hmm. 19, between 1990 and 1995 prices, mm -hmm. uh, we're all into it for maybe 750, 800 thousand. <laughs> you know, but you know, yeah. I, it, it was it was it was a struggling, struggling time for me back then. Yes, uh, but but you look back now, I'm assuming because I do the same thing, and it's like it was bad, but it was worth it. So the lessons I learned with that building, mm -hmm. oh, and I had a partner that I had to end up buying out ah. for more money than the property was worth. Um, the lessons I learned have uh, not only sustained me, but mm -hmm. I've made millions and millions of dollars as a result of those mistakes and the lessons learned. Mm -hmm. um, with contractors, with people that I partner up with, um, tenants, mortgage brokers, realtors, uh, vendors, when I mean vendors, lumber supply houses, electrical supply houses, plumbing supply mm -hmm. houses, uh, masonaries. I mean, I got robbed and I 
and I don't, ha- I didn't have anybody to blame. I, it took me years to understand it wasn't the people's fault that robbed me. It was my fault for, for allowing them to rob me. If that makes yeah, sense. it does make sense. But I, I, I think all of us go through that in one form or another when we're just beginning, even if I, I think we don't tend to listen to people's advice sometimes. And, and so we kind of go on our own and make mistakes and stumble through things and lose money and figure it out. And you did the same thing. The difference is you stuck to it all these years and now you've got a you know, $15, $20 million net worth uh, because you did. And right. you sure as hell didn't put that much money into it to get that oh, net no. worth. But we did put a lot of sweat and time and that's what yeah, we have to of course. Of like, course. As we said earlier, this is not a business for the weary or the tired or or the weak or anyone who thinks they're going to become, you know, I, it's funny. I had someone come up to me and they talk to me that, that they have a hundred and something doors. I don't remember exactly. And they tell them, they're bragging, oh, we're making $20,000 a month, you know, net cash flow. And I'm like, oh, that's great. And then he says, well, how much are you, how many doors do you have? And I'm like, we don't have as many as you. Um, mm-hmm. and well, how much are you making? I says, oh, you know, I said, you're doing great. I didn't say how much you were making. I said, you're doing great. But as I'm walking away, I'm saying to myself, so I have one building with six doors that I'm netting $23,000 a month from. You have over 100 doors that you're netting $20,000 from, and you're happy mm-hmm. about that, right? So my That's point a scary that, place to be in. Right. My point is the amount of doors you have is irrelevant. What matters is um, the quality of the door. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I, we don't really talk about our door numbers ever. And people ask constantly, and it's just, it's just a non-important thing to me. I don't care about door numbers. I care more about how much cash flow I have. I care how much a peace of mind I've got because of the equity that I've got in my properties. You know, the equity that I've got makes me sleep at night. You know, the cash flow is great. But for some reason, that equity and knowing that I'm in a good position, not much can actually hurt me on my properties. That makes me feel great. And I can live on the cash flow. Uh, I, I don't really ever touch my cash flow, but I could live on it if I wanted to. Uh, oh, I'm living on my cash flow now. I'm touching it all the time now. Screw it. Are you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Vacations, I'm fixing up the house, doing everything that I always wanted to do. Yeah. Um, it's like I tell you what, Mark, you get that that that. You don't have that monkey on your back about paying for college anymore. I'm like, you know what? Yeah. Done, yeah, it's like I've done my job. Now it's time for me. I got three more years, dude. Three more years. <laughs> three more years. That's it. That's it. Three years, and I'm done with that. But yeah, it's bittersweet. That's bittersweet too. We don't want to go down that road. We'll both be crying. But oh, but yeah. so if uh, if you were just starting out today, Dan, what would you do differently than you did when you were first starting out? If you had the knowledge that you've got now, let's say you're 25 years old and you know what you know, what would you start out with? I would trust but verify. Okay. Don't ever, ever, ever just assume that they they did what they were supposed to do. I don't care who that person is and what that and what that that business is, whether it be a contractor, a broker, a realtor, mortgage broker, whoever that is, doesn't matter. Your attorney, your accountant, whoever that is, that's important. <clears throat> Number two, I would take I would take more time out to learn the accounting side of the business, mm-hmm. so that I could you know ask the right questions to my tax accountant, so that I could get all my tax benefits. Because the biggest expense in this business is your taxes, if you let it be. But this the taxes could also be the least expensive mm-hmm. if you push your accountant and 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 you also educate yourself, right? Because um, your accountant yes. is only going to do as much as that you push them to do because they just push your paper. But now if you start asking them specific questions, well, why can't we do it this way rather than that way? And maybe he'll say, you know what? We can't do it this way because of the way you report this other income, but maybe we could do something a little different. Let's, you know, maybe create another LLC and then we mm-hmm. could do uh, uh, one below that one. There's so many different ways. So um, I, I, I would definitely educate myself in aspects of, of, of the accounting side, because I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. I was so preoccupied with making the money, I didn't realize that um, sometimes you don't, I can make less money, but go home with more money if I, mm-hmm. if I push my, my, my tax accountant to do the right thing. Uh, I'm not telling you to do anything illegal, I'm telling you to do all, all, all above, you know. Take advantage of the what 
the government's given us. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. And um, it's funny. I, th- I, I talk. Let me just add one thing there. I talk to so many young people that don't know how much they make. And, you know, I've always got a running total in my head of basically where we're at <clears throat> because I visit that quite a bit. And I know where I'm at financially. You know, when I talk to some younger people, and it's not always younger people, sometimes it's older people, and they can't tell me what they made on a flip, and they can't tell me what their year-to-date, you know, income is, it's kind of scary. You know, you should know these scary. things. It's you should know scary. these numbers, because you might be negative, and you don't even know it, and that's and how you people know it. leave the yep. business. Yeah, they I leave agree. the business. Yeah. I agree 100%. Um, so what, what, what would, would you, is, what would is you, in, what would, manage what your money? You, yeah. What would you invest in first? If you were just getting started in this in this environment, um, um, in, in any environment, but yeah, this we we we, we could hit both. That's so, a two part you know, question. When I when I bought my first property, and, and to be honest with you, to till to, to today, I still use that same philosophy. Mm-hmm. I don't buy where it's sexy. Mm-hmm. I want to buy right outside where it's sexy because mm-hmm. you know what happens is let's let's take the donut effect, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's real sexy in the middle of that donut. But the outskirts aren't so sexy. But when that middle of the donut starts getting so overpopulated and so expensive because of the demand, the sexiness starts to spread out. So mm-hmm. I want to be that one neighborhood. I want to be in that bad neighborhood that's right next to with that really good neighborhood. Because mm-hmm. it's going to it's gonna go in that direction, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want to go there when it started. I want to go there before it started. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to follow, believe it or not, one of the indicators I used to use, because I realized this quickly, thank God, was uh, I follow the young artists, the young white artists. They always mm-hmm. go into the neighborhoods that everyone's too scared to go into. And mm-hmm. once they set up camp there, for whatever the reason is, the regentrification starts. It yeah, just happens. I agree. Yeah, so, I mean, once, once people know that they're there, then yeah, it's okay. Right. So I, I see that I see that in LA all the time where yeah. places that you wouldn't even dream of living three years ago, people are moving in there now and flipping houses and they're magically done. That's beautiful. It's We're reality doing is one. Artists, they I, they have a total different mindset. My sister's an artist. You know, it's, we get into you know, we we have huge disagreements. Um mm-hmm. but I have to remember they just don't think like us and and mm-hmm. we don't think like them. It's just mm-hmm. Would just wired differently, mm-hmm. but they bring a whole new aspect to to an area. They'll bring in the cafes, you know. Uh, they bring in the openness. They they're very they for whatever reason they they bring a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to the area with their mm-hmm. personalities, mm-hmm. right? Uh, they open up the doors to to areas uh, as a result of their personalities and mm-hmm. acceptances, right? So you know, follow the artists. That's great advice. Uh, and same thing in Los Angeles. It's not necessarily artists, but, you know, young actors, actresses. Uh, and, and I sold a house uh, to an artist, a literal artist, in Echo Park about three years ago, four years ago. And we set a record for the area. And Echo Park was a, it was a pretty scary place uh, up until a few years ago. And now it's going gangbusters. So that that is abs- what, what Dan just said is absolutely true in any of the big cities. You know, watch watch where people are heading towards and and buy there. Yeah, yeah and, and be financially prepared. Mm-hmm. Because you can't, you're not going to be able to take advantage of the opportunity if you don't, if you're not financially prepared. And there's going to, you know, and there's going to be a lot of people who tell you you don't need any money to get into this business. And the reality is you do. Because eventually you got to pay the person to teach you how to get into this business with no money. That costs money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have to pay for for your mailings and your postage that you're going to be using to reach out to prospective sellers. That costs mm-hmm. money. Mm-hmm. If you use VAs, that costs money. Mm-hmm. If you have a website to set up, that costs money, right? Um, everything costs money. Mm-hmm. So you know you have to be financially prepared for the opportunities, which brings you back to the education. Um, mm-hmm. I always recommend people tell me, well, what do you tell me? Well, how should I start? I says, you need to financially get your house in, in, in order, and you need mm-hmm. to also educate yourself while you're getting your, your house in order, your mm-hmm. financial house in order. So that way, um, you're doing everything at the same time, and as a result of the education, 
it'll be easier for you to witness the opportunity or recognize mm -hmm. that opportunity. And then you'll have the financial wherewithal to take advantage of it because you've been doing both simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so important. I know Yuko and I did a, uh, a class on wholesaling, you know, right? Probably the first month we heard about real estate investing and that taught us how to find deals. And we took a class on private money and that taught us how to find money. Uh, and, but yeah, we had to have some money. I had to have a job at the time that was bringing in money to, to be able to do a lot of the stuff we did. So yeah, and and one more question on, on that vein. How do you feel about people having a job and investing versus just quitting their job and go investing full time and just hitting it hard? What, I, you know, well, you know, we've spoken about this, especially on campfire yeah. real estate. Yeah. I am so against that narrative, fire your boss. Amen. Not me. Now, I am not the guy who's ever had a boss either. Um, yeah. I've been self-employed since 1985. I mean, I, sh I, I shouldn't say that. I did have bosses, but I was always working at nine to five, and I did put in my time, and I gave mm -hmm. that I, I gave 100% when I was at work. Mm -hmm. But I realized that as a result of my discipline at work, it carried over to my after work uh, businesses that I was trying to create that discipline and you know I was out there trying to create another business so when I did not when I when I did quote unquote fire my boss mm -hmm. I took a big risk though um, thinking back I probably could have stayed on the job longer mm -hmm. but I don't know if my business would have been successful either yeah so you know, I remember when I left, it was a government job. And when I left the job, I was like, are you nuts? Like, you know, you're, gonna, you're leaving away from a pension, uh, medical benefits. And I was like, yeah, I just can't do this for the next 20 years. Um, and when they asked me what I was going to do, I said, I'm going to go open a video store. They said, oh, you're nuts. You're crazy. Well, I was in that store for over 20 years, right? Because the videos went, went from videos and video repairs and film developing and... and and then to uh, beepers and to cell phones. And, you know, we, we, out of there, we were, I, that's every every time I had extra money, I'd go buy another building in the neighborhood, right? That store also provided me the opportunity um, to know what was going on. So mm -hmm. as a result of creating relationships with your own customers and, you know, when there's a death in the mom and dad, when the brother comes over, he says, we just want to get rid of it. Do you want it? And I would always be honest. I'd say, listen, you get more money, go up the corner, give it to uh Century 21, and they'll mm -hmm. they'll sell more money, and they'd be like, no, but we just want out. And I said, okay, then this is the price. So, you know, I always gave them the choice, and I always told them the truth. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. But the mm -hmm. point was, you know, it generate it generated cash. I lived below my means, um, and I was always talking to people, right? You know, um, and always be right, do the right thing by people. Mm -hmm. Just do the right thing. It always comes back tenfold. Yeah, bad news travels so fast. Yeah, yeah, bad news travels real fast. So what's uh, what's next for Dan Barrero? Uh, you just turned 60. You just bought a new truck. Last kid's out of college. Uh, is it time to hit the beach and hang up your investing hat? What are you going to do? No, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll be 80 years old and I'll still be walking a job site or checking my buildings. Um, it's funny, my dad's 85 Mm -hmm. And he still does, you know, um, he still shows up to every single one of my job sites and he still tells me that he, I'm doing everything wrong. Uh, <laughs> but the the reality is, you know, my accountant, I remember he passed away when he's 94 and he retired when he's 92. And I used to ask him, I said, Mr. Hyde, you ever going to retire? He said, Danny, you retire, you die. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, two years later, he died. And he had to retire because he knew himself he wasn't keeping up anymore. Mm -hmm. he couldn't, mentally, he couldn't keep up. Yeah. Um, physically as well. But the point is, you know, I love what I do like you do. Why would you ever retire? You know, if you could still do what you do and make money, mm -hmm. why not? Right? Like, I go well, on vacation. Yeah. Totally. I go on vacation. I go, I'm like, I'm stopping at looking at property. I just wrote <laughs> off that right off that vacation. I was in California. I reached out to Mark. We did a meetup. I just yeah, wrote off a trip. Well, and it was a legitimate write off. We, we we did well we 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 were creating business for ourselves and and doing real estate stuff so yeah. exactly but you know the thing is like you know why would you 
I got a phone call. I won't say his name. Yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know him. He's actually been on our, 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 our campfire real estate. And he was saying, listen, you know, this nanny thing is getting real expensive. Uh, and I'm realizing the more money I'm putting into my kid's college fund, he just he has a newborn that's about a year old. Mm -hmm. I need to buy another property so it could pay for the nanny and pay for the college fund. And this is where I'm looking. So if you come across anything, let me know. Mm -hmm. You see the difference of the mindset? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? He said, let me go buy another property to pay for the nanny mm -hmm. and then pay for the college fund. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it's the mindset. So what's, what's, uh, what's in the... Totally agree. Totally agree. My, I've, my got, mindset I've got right now. I'm listening. No, I've got one house that is paid for Lucas's private high school. It's paying for college and it will continue. To, uh, it'll pay for everything. And it'll throughout. be, and when he's out of college, it'll be your pension. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's not getting it. No. No, right. not at all. So okay. actually, he will get it because I'm sure you're going to spend the money with your kids, right? Um, Probably, yeah. More yeah. Than like so, yeah. Look, in my case, I, I'm being extremely selective right now. I'm sticking to the one-bedroom condos, two-bedroom condos. I'm not looking to buy any multifamilies and do total guts anymore because um, I want to take time and smell the roses. Yeah. I want to do yeah. the traveling. Um, condos are easy to manage from a distance. I'm not worried about leaky roofs, water mains, sewer mains, windows, exterior lighting, landscaping, none of that. Uh, you know, sprinkler systems, I'm not worried about any of that. You pay your HOA fees, done, right? The challenge there is finding the right community. Yes. And the community yes. that's managed the proper way. That's the challenge. Yeah. Uh, but once you overcome that challenge and you figure out how to do that, um, it's extremely easy to manage from a distance, and, and and that's what I want to do. And then you also sell raw land too. How does that work? The raw land is great. Um, mm -hmm. I love the raw land side. I've kind of been. I sh how do I put this? I haven't been paying attention to that side of the business as much as I should. Yeah. Uh, but that side of the business, I love. I love uh, the fact that I, I sell this land sometimes on a mortgage. So I use, and my down payment is usually enough to cover my 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 cost. So mm -hmm. essentially, all I'm doing is financing my my profit money, and mm -hmm. I love it because now I'm 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 moving out my capital gain tax, my implications, right? And I'm I'm creating a, like anywhere between a 10 to a 13 percent interest rate on that loan. If they don't pay it, it, it's easy to take back. It's not difficult because it's not a homestead. So mm -hmm. it's I I love that side of the business. Um, and again, the challenge there is learning which lots to buy and which lots not to buy how to how to figure out which lots of flood zones or 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 wetlands um and making sure they have access to utilities you know it's uh making sure that they don't they're not housing endangered species like there's an area quickly in uh, uh sarasota county that uh, mm -hmm. has what they call scrub jays they're birds that nest on the ground if you have that on that lot you're done you, you know it's going to cost you thousands of thousands of dollars to to fix that problem um, so what I do is if I see it anywhere within a four block radius of that particular lot, I won't buy it because they can migrate there. You never know. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, those are the challenges. Um, uh, but that's not, once you learn them, they're no longer challenges. Yeah. Now, how do you find buyers for that? Uh, cause you're, you're buying raw land and subdividing it or it's already pre-subdivided I, I i'm not doing i'm not doing subdivisions where i have to subdivide it anymore i just don't even want to do that anymore it's got to be i don't blame you you know it's i'm looking at easy stuff now and if it's not not easy i i'm not looking to hit the the grand slam anymore mm -hmm. i'll mm -hmm. take the base hits all day long yeah the runs come in with the base hits right so how, how do you how do you find the buyers for that though um then it's relatively easy, believe it or not. It's so much easier than you think. Um, mm -hmm. A Facebook marketplace. Um, Interesting. You're going to be very surprised when I tell you this. Uh, the penny savers. Penny savers, that's still around? Yeah, but they're, they're digital mostly now. Yeah. Um, you got to advertise them in lo local uh, uh, papers. And, of course, you got to create a brand of trustworthiness, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, your name has a lot of value. Um, mm -hmm. 
if it's good. So a lot of it's through <laughs> word of mouth and recommendations from previous buyers. Got it. Got it. Yeah, like yeah. I don't advertise any of that on my social media, right? Uh, I may post every once in a while that I sold a lot, right? Yeah, yeah. But that in itself creates business, believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah, I would think so. Somebody wants to own a piece of land. It's not that expensive, so why not? No, it's very it's very inexpensive to, to maintain uh, mm-hmm. 100 bucks a year, 150 bucks a year. Um, people ask me, should I share it? I says, why? You know, I got sued one time with all the lots I've ever had. And the, they were on my property, and they hurt themselves. So it's okay, great. Why were you on my property? So I called the sheriff for the town. The sheriff went and locked them up because they admitted they were on my They were trespassing. They were suing me. They just admitted they were trespassing. Lawsuit went away. Yeah, that stuff happens here too. Yeah, we still. Yeah, get that, that doesn't happen. That happened to me in Florida. If that happened in New York, the lawsuit would not have gone away. No, no, no. They don't all your property right now, and you'd be living in Florida on one of those lots. In a yeah. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, indeed. Dan, thank you, buddy, for being on here. If anybody wants to get a hold of you, Dan's a wealth of knowledge. Like I said, we've known each other for a long time. We do slightly different stuff, but it's the same, really. Uh, But Dan has a uh, mastermind that he does. He's got a couple of products that he has. He's got this book uh, on all the construction materials he uses. He may have a copy handy. Oh, look at that. It's right there. Yeah. And uh, essentially, it's just it, this book has saved me hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, it, every detail to what you need to renovate an apartment for rental ready mm-hmm. is in this book as far as material you need and when you should use specific material in a C-class property versus a B or an A-class property, right? Um, and then the reasons why, right? So one of the things is I never use half-inch sheetrock. I always use five-eighths. And I use five eights because I intend to keep my properties from here to kingdom come, right? Mm-hmm. And there's multiple reasons why I could go into that, but um, you know, the quality of the material is what determines um, how much time you're going to spend managing that property. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the nicer it is, the better tenant it's. Even if in C class areas, you're going to get better tenants that are willing to pay a little bit more. So not only that, you're going to but you, you you're going to have a, a bigger pool to pick from. So that so just because it's a C class property doesn't mean they're gonna be C class tenants. Yeah. So in my C class properties, I'm usually placing A class tenants, meaning, you know, A class tenants in the sense of maybe not economically, but everything else about as far as uh, being re- financially responsible and socially mm-hmm. responsible, right? Mm-hmm. You know, minding that their noise is not gonna interfere with the the quality of life of their neighbors, for instance. Right. So um what I'm saying is, you know, when you when you when you provide a better product than what the neighborhood is is accustomed to, you're going to get uh, the cream of the crop that you could pick from. Yeah, that's that's a golden nugget, guys. That's a golden nugget right there. Uh, if anybody wants to find you, that we'll put we'll put your contact information in the show notes. Yeah, it's, but, but it's Dan, you know, you can go to Dan Barrero. Uh, just type in Daniel Barrero in on Google, and you'll have all my. My, 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 my social media, including my website, yeah. or you can go to usalandventures.com. Right. That's great. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow night on Campfire that's Real right. Estate. That's, uh, yep. that's uh, at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time every Thursday night. It's on one of our channels. But uh, if you see uh, that I'm on a live at that point, you can jump in. Uh, we answer questions, do a lot of great stuff there, Dan and I. Uh, uh, and Gerald and Welby uh, enjoy that and have a good time. Yeah, and I got to tell you, I'm, I'm really proud of that, Mark, that platform yeah. that we put together. We have helped so many. We, we've helped thousands of people. Yep. Um, yep, absolutely. It's all it's all free. We're not asking for anything on that. It's just, uh, just our way of giving back to the community. So, Dan, thank you so much for being on. I appreciate it, buddy. Uh, you're a good friend, a colleague, and... Uh, Appreciate your time today, bud. No, thank you for asking me. I have, you know, every time I share the screen with you, it's a wonderful time. Uh, thanks, man. I appreciate you. Take care, Mark. All right. See you guys. Thank you guys for t- tuning in. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.